Hi. Um, before I go any further, I just want to warn you that the presentation does contain flashing content. So if that makes you feel uncomfortable, please do let me know now. Okay. So let's get started. Has anyone in the audience ever come across an error page like this before, where it says, hang on a sec, our site's experiencing more traffic than usual, but you know, you should be able to get back to shopping shortly. Raise your hands if you have. Okay, so there's actually quite a few of you in the audience. And um, I did some research about this, and it is fairly common. Even the most reputable sites displayed this type of error message about not being able to handle the level of traffic that's hitting their application. Even Amazon, on Amazon Prime Day, as I'm sure you can all imagine, um, there was this huge spike in user traffic hitting their site. And as a result, users were just unable to access the site and they couldn't make the purchases they wanted to make. Think about the loss of sales as a consequence. But going back to the jQuery experience, I have to be honest about it. I was slightly embarrassed, if not disappointed in myself. When I visited the site, I visited the site um, and thought about my own personal experience, not being able to make the purchase I really wanted to make. But I didn't really think about it from the other perspective. I build websites just like the ones I've mentioned. And never once did I think, could my users be having a similar experience? Hi, my name is Katie Koshland. I'm an engineer and technical lead. And I work at the Financial Times. The Financial Times is one of the world's leading business news organizations. And it's recognized internationally for its authority, integrity and accuracy. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about my load testing journey. And I'm going to aim to cover the core concepts behind load testing. First, I'll start with a challenge. And this is how I came across the topic of load testing. I'll then go on to explain what it means to load test your application and how you can get started with writing your first script. Then I'll go on to explain how you can use the metrics to help identify performance issues within your application and discuss the tools and techniques we use at the FT to help troubleshoot and improve such issues. And then I'll conclude with some outcomes. So the challenge. I recently finished a three-month secondment in the Operations and Reliability Engineering team where we were developing the BizOps API. The purpose of the BizOps API was to provide a central store of all business information across the FT. Um, above illustrates the model and the type of information that, be, that would be retrieved from the BizOps API. So you can see here, there's information about systems, how those systems relate to other systems, and how those then go on to relate to groups, teams, and people across the FT. And so this API and application was going to use, it was going to be used frequently across the company. And so we really needed to understand the technical limits of the application. So that was my challenge. It was testing the technical limits of our application. But more specifically than that, could I answer the following three questions? Will our application crash? If so, can our application recover? And what exactly happens to that user experience? Once we found the limit of our application and push past it, does the user experience degrade gracefully or does it just cause an absolute meltdown? And I was told that the answer could be found by load testing our application. So what exactly is load testing? A colleague of mine recommended an excellent talk by Jad Meucci, where he describes load testing in simple terms. It's about simulating ordinary user activity and then applying enough stress until it reaches failure. I really like this definition, but it kind of led me to my next question, which is, 
So how can you actually go about and apply that so-called stress to the application? So first, what you need to do is you need to decide on a testing framework. There are many frameworks out there, um, including popular ones like Apache Bench, Gatelink, Locus, Artillery Work. Um, but I decided to go with Artillery, and it was for the following five reasons. First, it could be used and installed using NPM, which was really great if I wanted to get started quickly as we were building a Node application. The other thing was it allowed you to customize JavaScript code. So what you could do was you could write a random, you could write a function separately, um, in our case, to generate random write queries, and then call it in your script each time a virtual user was to make a request. You could also, um, you could write, for example, a JavaScript function that sets headers or it sets cookies, and then each time your virtual user makes a request in your script, you can just import the function and call it. Um, and that was really helpful, and you can see above a snapshot of how we went about and did that. Another advantage was that scripts could be configured using YAML. And again, this is just a snapshot, but what you can see is by writing it in YAML, it makes the scripts really easy to read, maintain across your team. And you can see here that I'm calling the set headers function I mentioned previously. And also, it's targeted co towards continuous integration. Unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to implement this ourselves, but this is something I'm particularly interested in and would really like to do in our next project. If performance is a high priority within your application, what you can do is you can configure your continuous integration, let's say Circle CI, um, and run your script each time you trigger a build. What this allows you to do is that you're able to detect at each point in your application and your development process how that feature directly impacts performance. And so you can detect any regressions in your application. And finally, it provides detailed metrics. And I'll go on to explain that shortly. So once you've decided on your testing framework, um, you'll then need to think about the type of requests that be hitting your application. So what your scripts need to do is they need to be able to represent ordinary user activity. So what you want to do is you want to think about the common user journeys that are hitting your application and try to mirror what your real users are making and capture that behavior so your virtual users are making the same type of requests within the application. And after that, you need to decide on the shape of load that's hitting your application. You're probably thinking, like, what do I actually mean by the shape of load? And I'll go on to explain this. If you take this graph above as an example, it illustrates the shape of load that was hitting the FT.com homepage over a 24-hour during the 2017 election results. So what you have is you have time across the x-axis, and then you've got the number of user requests along the y-axis. And you can see here that the shape of load changes drastically over time. You've got peaks where the number of concurrent requests per minute are extremely high. And then you have troughs where there's like this very low level of concurrent requests. And so what you really want to do is you want your scripts to be able to capture the different shapes of load that could potentially be hitting your application over a production cycle. And this can be really challenging. Um, before production, you know, it's really difficult to predict the number of concurrent users and how they would essentially ramp in over time. But it's really crucial if you want your scripts to be as robust as possible. So if your application's already in production, you might already know the shape of load that's hitting your application. For example, um, a situation where you could predict the shape of load beforehand is before the release of a push notification. So last week, um, the FT mobile app sent out a push notification to notify users that the UK Supreme Court ruled against Boris Johnson's suspension of Parliament. Before the push notification went out, the app was doing approximately 250 requests per minute. And shortly after the push, what you can see is it reached 2.6 million requests per minute. And it wasn't just the app it impacted, it was also the website. 
FT.com before the push notification was doing 200,000 requests per minute and shortly after the push it reached over 550,000 requests per minute. So in this situation we can predict you know the shape of load is going to be a huge spike in user traffic over this very short period of time. But you know it's also okay if you actually don't know the shape of load. As the BizOps API was still in the development stage, you know, as I mentioned, it's difficult to predict the number of concurrent users and how they ramp in. But you know, it's really crucial. So if this is the case, what you want to do is you might want to consider splitting your script into four separate phases. What this is doing is you're allowing for um, your scripts to capture the potential different types of load that would be hitting the application. And depending on the size of your application will depend on how you define these four separate phases. But I'll, um, I'll explain to you what I thought was appropriate for the scale of our application. So first you have um, a warm-up phase, and I define this as the arrival rate of 10 virtual users per second that lasted for 60 seconds. Then I defined a ramp-up phase. This is when it went from an arrival rate of 10 to 25 new virtual users per second for 120 seconds. Then I defined a cruise phase, and this was the arrival rate of 25 virtual users per second for 1,200 seconds. And then finally, I defined a crash phase, and this is really the concept of you know finding that limit and really pushing past it. And for our application, this was the arrival rate of 100 virtual users per second for 30 seconds. So it's a very short burst of time. But what's really important to note here is that there's no point hitting your application with a load you know that it can handle. The purpose of this phase is to make the application crash. What you want to do is you want to be able to understand the exact behavior of your application once you've pushed past the limit. You want to be able to answer questions like, you know, will your application recover? Does it recover on its own? Will it require an engineer to come in late at night to make the fix? And how long does that end up taking? These are the kind of questions you really want to be able to answer from the crash phase. And to visualize this, what I've done is I've identified these four phases in a production cycle. Again, it's a graph showing um, the number of requests per second hitting the FT.com homepage over a 24-hour period. And what you can see is from 12.30 a.m. to 6 a.m., there's this very low level of five requests per second, and that's the warm-up phase. Then from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., there's this gradual increase in the number of requests per second from 5 to 11. And this is clearly during our users' daily commute. And what I've defined as the ramp-up phase. Then, from 9 a.m. to midday, there's this constant rate of 11 requests per second. This is what I discussed as the cruise phase. And then what I've done is I've extrapolated the graph to what I think would be appropriate for the size of this application for the crash phase. And that's about 40 requests per second. So, okay, you've, you've made decisions on the testing framework, the type of requests, and the shape of load. You know, you're ready to write your first script. So let's discuss how you can get started. What should your first script look like? So the script should be split into two separate sections. First, you have the config section. And what you do is you start by choosing the target of your load test, so the address of the API server under test. For us, it was the BizOps API staging endpoint, but because it, the staging environment was an exact replication of production, it was a fair test, and we could use the staging and be confident that it would produce similar results. And then you can specify any plugins you'd like to use. Um, we use a plugin that allowed us to send the output um, of our load test to Graphite and Grafana. What Graphite is is our metrics data store, and Grafana is the presentation and, and data visualization layer. And what this did was it really helped us monitor over time um, and create graphs that later helped identify performance issues and troubleshoot along the way. 
And after you've done that, what you do is you define the load phases. Um, and this is what we discussed previously, you know, about the number of concurrent virtual users and the method of how they go about ramping in. And then what you have is the processor. This is where you import any JavaScript files that contain functions you want to use in your script. And um, so above what you can see is a snapshot of essentially what the config section should look like. After that, you have the scenario section. And this is where you identify what the virtual user's behavior is going to be during the test. So you define the type of request that your user is going to make. So you start with naming the virtual user request. In this case, the user request was going to retrieve a list of all systems at the FT and their corresponding properties. By adding a name and providing a description, it's very quickly easy to identify during the load test how many times that query has run. And then what you do is you define the flow, and that's the array of operations that a virtual user will perform during your script and your load test. In the example here, you can see what we're doing is making a um, post request with a GraphQL um, JSON body that contains a GraphQL query um, to the root GraphQL. And you can see here again that I'm calling the set headers function I mentioned previously. And it, you don't have to just do one query, this is a snapshot. You can do multiple queries within the same script. And it's also really important to note here that, you know, if you wanted to, you could also um, assign weights to the queries. So what a weight does is it allows the probability for one query or probability of a scenario being picked by a new virtual user to be waived relative to other scenarios. So you could assign a weight of two to one query and one to the other query, um, and it's as simple as that. And once you're happy with the script and you've put both the config and scenario section together, you're ready to go. And you can run the load test using the following command, artillery run, the file path, and the name of the file. Okay, cool. So you've now run the script, but you know, what happens after you run the script? So what artillery will do is it provides you with detailed metrics, um, and that helps analyze the behavior of your application when it's under load. So you have scenarios launched. That's the number of virtual users that have launched a scenario throughout the test. You've got scenarios completed. That's the number of virtual users that have completed a scenario throughout the test. You've got requests completed the total number of HTTP requests and responses sent, requests per second, the average number of requests per second completed throughout the test, and status codes, HTTP status code responses from each request that has been completed. And finally, request latency, how long it takes a server to receive and process a request, and that's measured in milliseconds. So, okay, we understand now what the metrics mean, but like, how do we actually use the metrics um, to help identify a performance issue? So, above is an example of one of the early summary reports from our script. And you can see here that we noticed that the request latency started to grade rapidly during our load test. It went from about 67 um, 0.6 milliseconds, and then suddenly ramped up to exceeding past 30,000 milliseconds. And this was really concerning because we were only sending on average 20 requests per second. And so we were expecting our application to be able to handle a much higher level of requests per second. And out of the 6,000 scenarios launched and completed, more than 90% of requests received an HTTP status code 500 indicating the server was aware of an error or simply incapable of performing the request, or 503, indicating it actually just couldn't hit the server at all. And so the metrics about response times, throughput rates, status codes, helped identify a serious performance issue early on in our development process that could essentially just stop our application from running. So we've got this performance issue. How, what, what do we do next? How do we find the culprit? So 
We ran several tests, singling out each query and sending the metrics to Graphite and Grafana. And after a couple of attempts, we had found the culprit. It was this GraphQL query, which was trying to retrieve the first 600 systems that had a bronze service tier at the FT. In fact, what we realized was we were reaching 100% CPU when running this query, and it was at this very low level of 10 requests per second. The fact that we were reaching this 100% CPU utilization with this very low level of requests per second led us to believe that, you know, perhaps it could be an application issue. We wanted to determine whether there was something in our code base that was causing the CPU to max out. So a good starting point was to generate a flame, a flame graph in order to profile the CPU usage. And what we did was we used this plugin called Zero X. And with the first line, you can install it using NPM, which is nice and quick. And with the second command above, what it does is it will generate the flame graph for you, and it will, in fact, open it in a separate browser. So, you know, it's really quick to get started. And above is the flame graph we generated. And with a flame graph, all the data um, is on the screen at the same time, and the hottest code paths are immediately obvious as the widest functions. Annoyingly, though, there was nothing unusual being displayed. There was no one single line of code that was using up all of the CPU that we could just go in and fix. So we really needed to think about, you know, what else could essentially be causing that performance issue? And so our database was a Neo4j instance run by GraphemeDB. And when a user makes a query using GraphQL, what happens is it hits an execution layer in our case, this NPM module called Neo4j GraphQLJS. And that translates the GraphQL query into a Cypher query. So this was a query in GraphQL that was causing the performance issue. And you can see that it gets translated into the Cypher query. So what happens is it translates it into the Cypher query, and then it would send the request directly to our Neo4j instance. So we decided to look into the configuration of this NPM module and see whether we could identify a performance issue there. And what we noticed was that the driver had a maximum pool size of 100 connections. So this meant that if a session um, tried to acquire a connection, but the pool was at capacity, you'd have to wait until a free connection was available. Or, you know, we would see an HTTP status code 503, which we had seen in our load test. So, you know, we increase the pool size, we decrease the retry timeout, but unfortunately, we weren't hitting the capacity of the pool size, and so increasing the pool size had no impact on the performance. So what we did next was we looked into the Cypher query and Cypher tuning more specifically. With Neo4j, what you can do is you can see how um, a particular query performs by prefixing it with profile. So we ran profile on the particular query that was causing the problem, and this was the output. What we're really interested to see here is the total number of database hits from this query, and that was approximately 14,000. What the objective of query, pro query profiling is, is to find a way in which you can reduce the number of database hits required to perform the task whilst keeping the output level constant. So what we did was we created an index on service tier with the hope that, you know, that would improve the performance of the query. By creating an index, you reduce those number of database hits. And we ran profile again, and it worked. It did significantly reduce the number of database hits whilst keeping the output constant. However, it didn't resolve the performance issue. In fact, it had no impact. So what we did finally was we looked at the configuration of our Neo4j instance. What was the size of the instance? Did we have the correct RAM size? And how many cores did we have on the server? Was it the correct amount of cores? Um, so what we did was we ran system info in the Neo4j browser. And this provided us with information about the size of our database. From this, we used the Neo4j hardware sizing calculator. And what it recommended was to increase the size of total RAM, 
increase the number of cores on our server. And you know, that could explain why the CPU was maxing out. So that's what we did. We looked at the different plans, improved our plan to performance one. And this had eight gigabytes of RAM two cores on the server. So we were kind of convinced, you know, this will definitely have an impact and improve the overall performance. So, you know, we made the change, we ran the scripts again. Confusingly, even from moving from a shared resource to a dedicated resource and increasing the RAM size and the number of cores, it didn't help um, improve the performance. In fact, it actually made the performance worse. Um, <coughs> So then, you know, we thought, okay, we've kind of thought of a lot of different techniques. Perhaps, you know, it could be a network input-output issue. So, you know, when the database results are queued for processing by CPU, if the input and output's limited, you know, the queue of database results will back up, potentially causing a struggling CPU. Um, so we were going to look into this next. So you're probably really thinking, like, okay, come on already, like, you've spoken about all these troubleshooting techniques, like, you know, what was the fix? Like, what did you do to resolve this performance issue? And unfortunately, from one day to the next, the performance issue just disappeared. <laughs> yeah. I know. Engineering. We were all of a sudden able to make 25 requests per second without the application crashing. So for this particular example, we were actually unable to find the solution to this problem. So you're probably thinking, why have you shared this particular example with me? Not one where you know you've significantly improved performance. And um, and the reason is I I believe that what I've learned is really invaluable, and I want to be able to share that part with you. You know, I've been able to build a personal toolbox with tools and techniques that will help me eradicate and identify future culprits. But also, you know, there were practical outcomes to this. First, you know, we were able to measure, assess, and improve the overall performance of our application even if it was very slightly. And um, by load testing, you know, we were able to detect a performance issue early on, and as a result, dedicate time to help improve the performance of the application before it went into production. We knew the limits. And we were also able to assess the reliability of our application. By load testing, we increased our confidence that our application could stay online given a certain level of traffic. And we knew exactly at what point we would need to consider scaling the application in order for it to stay online. So to conclude, what I'd like to say is if, if you really want to fully understand the performance and reliability of what you're building, you should be considering load testing your application. And it doesn't just have to be in production. You should start from the development stage. So thank you for listening. Um, and we're also hiring, so either visit this URL or um, just come and chat to me after. Thank you.